Welcome to the Small Group Leader Podcast, a podcast by small group leaders for small group leaders to be equipped and encouraged as they make disciples for Jesus. My name is Derek Lynn, and in this episode, we will be speaking to Alex Rodriguez, the National Training Director for Chi Alpha, and the creator of our teaching for this episode, Inviting the Many to Disciple the Few. Then we will be interviewing Lucas Romero, a small group leader in the marketplace who has done an incredible job making disciples without being centered around the college campus. We know there will be many small group leaders this fall who won't be able to interact with people on campus as before. Lucas has some great insight into the mindset we must have if we are going to continue to grow our small groups no matter the circumstances in which we find ourselves. But first, let's listen to part of Alex's teaching on reaching the many to disciple the few. In the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22, Jesus tells a story of many being invited to a wedding feast, symbolizing the wedding feast of God to humanity, but many rejected the invitation, causing the father of the groom to go and invite whomever he could come in. Summarized by Jesus in the statement, for many are called or invited, but few are chosen. And of course, Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. Jesus explains how seed, the gospel, was scattered on four different types of soil. Among a path with no root, the gospel was stolen by the devil. Among a rock with no root, the gospel is withered by tribulation. Among the thorns with no root, the gospel is forgotten for pleasures of life. Among good ground, it produced fruit a hundred, sixty, and thirty-fold. According to this parable, the reception of the gospel has a 25% retention rate. Now, I do not believe that statistic is objectively true every time within every place. Eleven of the twelve disciples made it to the end for a 91% retention. Historians believe Charles Finney's revival retention was 75%, and Billy Graham has gone on record hoping his crusades had a minimum of 10% retention. But do you see the real matter at hand? Jesus preaches, many will not love him, few will find him. This is the preaching of the Bible. Yes, there are revivals. Equally true, there are regressions. But ultimately, the campus that feels like a failure because it has not seen the salvation of every student must remember Jesus himself says many will fail him by choosing to be unsaved. And yet, to strive for anything less than this gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth and be my witnesses to the ends of the earth and make disciples of all the nations is to fail Jesus. Do you see the paradox? Jesus says many will be unsaved no matter what. Jesus also says all must hear no matter what. What does this mean for us? It means we do not need to be dismayed when people reject Jesus. This is in line with the heartbreaking prophecy of Jesus. It should break our hearts as well that many prefer to offend him than obey him. And two, Do not add to the many being unsaved because we're not telling people about the gospel. As Calvinistic preacher John Piper has said, no matter what you believe about predestination, if you do not offer people an opportunity to receive God, you are robbing them. We are still commissioned to go out and make disciples. We are still commanded to preach, repent, and believe. We're still commanded to speak truth and love. We're still commanded to teach everything Christ has commanded us. Yes, many will reject the Christ, prefer their rebellion, offend him, irrationalize him, choose feeling over fidelity, and forget him. But if the people of God do not make disciples, if we do not invite people to the wedding feast, it will be many more that are not saved. If my maximum effort only results in saving a few, then I better give my maximum effort. Jesus is too worthy to be offended by anything other. So understanding that many will offend him and few will follow him, how exactly should one build a small group of disciples? The parable of the sower has stated, only one seed sown on four soils return fruit. As mentioned before, this is not an objective science so much as a general idea. Allow me to elaborate these divine mathematics using a Chi Alpha setting. If a small group leader gets 20 numbers, More often than not, five will discontinue. It's usually not out of spite. 
They just prefer Sigma Chi parties or the Pagan Student Society's guy to girl ratio or the math club's job resume appeal. Five will remove themselves because they are unavailable to you because they're available to something or someone else. So now a leader has 15. And more often than not, five more will ask, what exactly is this group? And upon hearing the explanation, we are Chi Alpha Campus Ministry or Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship. They will disconnect themselves because they had preset ideas of what to do in college. And none of those preset ideas align with the connotations that come with the word ministry or Christian. So five more will remove themselves because they are unfaithful. So now a leader has 10. And more often than not, when a small group gets going and one-on-ones begin to take place, a leader will preach and teach and disciple to both repent and believe truth in love, and about five people will become offended because the gospel, which has gladness, also has gravity. They love hearing about God's love for us. They will loathe hearing how God commands us to love our enemies. They will enjoy hearing how Christ died on a cross for us. They will become uncomfortable hearing how this same Christ commands us to pick up a cross for him. They will relish in hearing how God has forgiven them. They will be offended at the audacity of God to command us to forgive another. So five more will remove themselves because they are unteachable. What was once 20 phone numbers is now five faithful, available, teachable disciples. If we are going to disciple the few... We have to start by first inviting the many, and they will weed themselves out until only the faithful, available, and teachable are left. Invite the many so we can disciple the few. All right, I am back now with Alex. How you doing, Protein? I'm doing well. <laughs> doing very good. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. It's good to... Have you back on the podcast? Always good to be here. It feels like it's been across forever. from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so looking at this teaching that we just got to listen to a little bit of, why did this teaching come about? What was the need you saw, or how did the Lord put this in front of you? Uh, yeah, invite the many to disciple the few. We saw numerous small group leaders were inviting few and losing many from small group. And we asked uh, two questions that we would ask in various staff meetings. Why and what if? Why and what if? So when we studied the Bible, it became abundantly clear that inviting many over a few is the biblical responsibility of Christians to go out from the wedding feast to invite people from the outside to the inside. That is our why. That's all across the Bible, to go out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, to be witnesses for Jesus. Likewise... We notice small groups are built small when leaders wait for people to come to them as opposed to going out and finding people, you yeah. know, uh, that, that's just, we want our people to be proactive, not reactive. And I don't know very many college students that come to the secular campus that are looking specifically for Christian ministry. I know they're there, yeah. but I also know that it's a rarity when you're working with a secular campus. So mm-hmm. we wanted our people to be proactive as opposed to reactive. And if we want to take many students deep with Jesus, then we need to invite as wide as possible to cast the net wide and uh, find, feed, and fight for lost lambs of God. So that's basically where it came from, this idea that uh, what if a small group leader who's getting five numbers and losing four people, what if they were to simply just up the ante of how many phone numbers they were trying to get during Welcome Week? That that was our what-if question. What if asking 20 people could result in, you know, you're still going to lose people? What if it resulted in five in small group? And what if asking 40 people resulted in 10 in small group? Uh, Knowing full well that different personalities could very much have different results, but we wanted to try to raise the the asking quota, if you will, believing that we'd have greater small group retention. That makes sense. Someone who's looking at this and going, okay, semester's starting. I need to go out and invite a lot of people. What advice would you give to one of those people who might feel daunted by that idea? Whether it's meeting a lot of people or even getting rejected by a lot of people because that might come along with meeting a lot of people. Right. Rejection is... uh... It's common, you know, it's not just limited to middle school Sadie Hawkins dances or whatever. <laughs> uh, good times, good memories. Uh, yeah. Leonard Ravenhill once said, if the world cannot get along with the holiest man that ever lived, how can they get along with you and me yeah. unless we're compromised? So I do believe rejection has Christ as company. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty good, you know, that's at least it makes it 
bearable. Yeah. Uh, furthermore, if you're afraid of rejection, then leadership in any world, secular or sacred, is just not for you. Everyone yeah. has an opinion on what the small group leader should and should not do because everyone has an opinion on the leader. So if we're not comfortable with rejection, there is no leadership position in the world that we're going to get used to. Mm. Um, the title leader may be shiny, but the responsibility is very heavy and only few can carry it to the end, which is exactly what Jesus wants us to do. Mm. So I, I think if we're afraid of rejection, it's probably because we have a habit of being afraid of the unfamiliar and we don't yeah. know what's going to happen as a small group leader going out of the campus, inviting people. So if we're afraid of rejection, I think to become more familiar with it, we need to study it. Hmm. Looking at the Bible, you got Stephen rejected by being stoned with rocks for preaching the gospel. Moses was rejected by Israel for getting God in his own leadership by building a calf made of gold. David's kingship was rejected by his own son. Daniel's holiness was rejected by his colleagues who conspired to get him thrown into a lion's den. Rejection and Christian living biblically and prophetically go hand in hand. And the more we learn this, the less we are shocked by that rejection. Yeah. Second... If we're afraid of rejection, I think we just need to experience it more. Yeah. You can't go back in time to middle school and re-experience <laughs> City Arkansas. I would not want to. I, Blink-182 music and so on and so forth and <laughs> Axe Body Spray and Surge Energy oh, Drinks and all of that good stuff. The Axe. Uh, there are some Generation Z people that might not know what I'm talking about, but that's just fine. But uh, <laughs> if the worst thing that happens to us is someone screening our phone calls or simply saying no to an invitation of friendship, yeah, that's not that bad. And the more you experience rejection, the more comfortable you would get with it. And the more you experience it, the more you learn how to get less of it. So I think failure is a good thing when it's learned from. Learning from failure is a prerequisite to fruitfulness. And I think that's yeah. something that I find encouraging, you know. And hopefully everyone else can find that encouraging as well. So when you get rejected, we need to ask those two questions again. Why and what if? And then yeah. learn and try again. Yeah, that's so good. So... I wanted to ask this. Have you ever experienced or known someone who invited 20 people and all 20 of them stuck around and their small group became a large group? And what would you say to someone who might be thinking through that what if of happening to them if they were to invite 20 people and, well, what if all of them stick around? Right. That's a great question. Uh, it, it's a it's a rarity, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I do remember a small group uh, back in the day. The small group leaders were Josh Nicholas and Chris Scroggins. And one year they co-led and they had like 20 plus guys in their small group. It was a small group, immediately became a large group. Yeah. And uh, it's rare, but what these guys did was they delegated responsibility to other leaders that took care of the other members within the small group. So you, you it was kind of like watching... Um, you know, they, these two leaders had their own Peter, James, and Johns who took yeah. care of the rest of the disciples. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. That's a good delegating of responsibility to create maturity within the group. Uh, and just watching that, you could see it was also very fruitful. There were people in that small group that went on to uh, become great small group leaders, and they graduated, and they have changed the marketplace for Jesus, and a lot of them have changed the, the ministry for Jesus, which yeah. is awesome. So yeah. it's a great experience if you do invite 20 and keep all 20. Yeah. It's incredibly rare, but how wonderful and how fruitful could that be? Yeah. That opportunity to de delegate responsibility, to create maturity within the small group, and just the ability to change more lives because you have more people. Mm. That's highly encouraging. More people equals more opportunity. Yeah. That's awesome always a good thing. Um, I do think, uh, to answer your second question, what would you say to someone who might be thinking the what if of that happening? I, I know it sounds overwhelming. Uh, one person leading 20 is more taxing than two people leading 20. But if you do have that one person leading 20, I, th I think you do have that opportunity to delegate, yeah. which we've mentioned yeah. already. I also think you have the opportunity to turn a small group into a cell group and split saying you take these people I'll take these people and we'll continue building so that we can you know max out again and turn a small group into a large group you know yeah. um, and that's that's healthy I, I think just the idea to have more people equaling more opportunity is a wonderful thing uh, again it's very rare to have a 100% retention rate when you go out and find people on campus mm -hmm. it, it's yeah haven't seen that hardly at all once and maybe 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So is this a teaching 
just for Welcome Week, or is there something to be said for meeting and inviting more people beyond the first couple events or weeks of school? I think it has to be for Beyond Welcome Week. Yeah, I, I do notice that the attrition, uh, small group leader attrition, we noticed specifically at New Mexico State University, if you didn't come to a leader's retreat, you wouldn't make it past August. So there's that kind of attrition that's happening. Mm. Uh, with small group members, a lot of them that would go into the winter break didn't emerge out of the winter break. You go home you, to old high school friends, you get caught in old high school ways, and uh, perhaps that could be the end of a lot of people's discipleship. So it, you do see a lot of small groups start with five and then attrition to three or two. That yeah. that happens, yeah. you know, when, when spring starts. Um, so I think to always be discipling people, you want to keep finding, feeding, and fighting for people. There's mm. no reason that a small group building season has to be limited to August. I, I think a, a lot of our frustrations when we look at discipleship and the small group model is, you know, the big win is getting someone to do a leadership training class. Yeah. And to do a leadership training class, you build a small group in August, and then you disciple the people from September through December. And then you say, hey, it's January. It's time to do this leadership training class. But if no one does it, you see a lot of small group leaders kind of grow on, go on cruise control from January until the next August. That's, yeah, that's yeah, eight yeah. months, man, yeah. of doing nothing and just waiting until they build it again. But if you only have three years to be a small group leader, freshman, you're in small group, but then it's so, assuming that you start small group leading your sophomore year, that's only three years. You, you, yeah. don't, you cannot afford an eight-month cruise control from January until August to wait to build small groups again. So I, I do think... From August to May, there are still people looking for friends. There are still people sitting alone in the cafeteria. There's still faithful, available, teachable people on the campus of 2,000, of 20,000, and of 60,000 mm -hmm. that do need to be found and fed and fought for. And uh, attrition or not, it's our responsibility to try to reach as many as we can because we only have three years to change the campus. Yeah. We only have three years to truly replicate ourselves before we have to graduate and move on and change the marketplace. Yeah. And I'll even say, looking at the students and the small group leaders that I can think of and remember that have had this conviction that whether it's welcome week, the middle of the semester, or during the break— they're always looking around for somebody to find, invite. Every conversation they have is an opportunity, that type of thing. I've seen them transition better into making disciples after college, yes. whether it's going into the mission field or going into the marketplace, than other people who are used to just doing it in spurts when an event is there. Right. They, it's just this conviction that I need to make disciples in season and out, yes. and it transitions outside of the college campus. Oh, it's, I, absolutely. I, I think if small group leading is based entirely, exclusively into Welcome Month, yeah. then our small group is a, an event-based small group. Yeah. You know, we, we build from the event and we don't build again until the next event. And that's not uh, in line with what we call missional community or missional rhythm, mm. I think is, is something that Derek Britt's going to talk about later on this podcast. And the whole idea of missional rhythm is exactly what you said. If you can learn to make disciples by finding, feeding, and fighting for the people that you're always around, yeah. uh, going from the grocery store to the gym to the dormitory, whatever it might be, yeah. you're going to have a more significant chance of making disciples when you graduate, heading in the marketplace, like the vast majority of Chi Alpha alumni do, yeah. uh, being around people that you're working with from 9 <laughs> to 5, you know, and that's, that's a huge win. Yeah. So... Is this teaching just about a magic number? Is the number 20 where all the stars align? And as long as at the end of the week I look at my phone and there are 20 new numbers, I know that I've won. Or is there a deeper conviction that we need to take away from this? Right. I don't think there's anything magical with the number 20, for sure. Yeah. I do believe what we talked about in the parable of the sower is very intriguing mm -hmm. uh, of what Jesus did with uh, the seed being sown four different times, but it catches only once, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I don't think we need to re-explain that. The heart behind the teaching is not to go out and get 20. The heart behind the teaching is if we invite the many, we can disciple the few. We believe that, Ma that Jesus says in Matthew 7, many will turn away. We believe that the gate is narrow. So we're going to invite as many people as we possibly can. We're going to be those servants that go out from the wedding feast yeah. into the streets, into the places, and invite as many people as we can to come and meet Jesus because more people equals more opportunity. And that's our mission. If this gospel 
is going to be preached to the ends of the earth so the end will come it's going to hinge on christians becoming responsible to more and going out and finding more and feeding more and fighting more until jesus comes back Awesome. It is so good to have you on here, Lucas. I wanted to start off by asking, how long have you been leading small groups now, if you include your time as a student with Chi Alpha and also in the workforce since graduating leading a small group? So I started going to Chi Alpha um, in 2012, and I yeah. graduated in 2016. So there I led small group for close to five years. Yeah. And I've been at my current position for about three and a half years. So ever since I got plugged into the local church, I went ahead and started doing that. So it's been about eight years now that I've been leading small groups. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, It's so exciting to hear about people who are taking the stuff um, and the convictions and the discipleship that they're learning and experiencing in Chi Alpha and then transitioning it to a different context. Definitely. So you're currently leading multiple small groups right now. Each of them have very different people in different stages and ages of life. One of those groups is made up of mostly unsaved guys and includes up to to 20 guys you are trying to disciple. How did you develop this small group in the beginning? So this small group is a small group I have at work. And when I started working, I said, God, I want you, I want you to use me in the workforce. So yeah. since I've been at work, I've actually been in three different teams. Yeah. So at my very first job, I met these guys, Scott, Rob, John, and Gavin, and we became really good friends. So I said, you know what, guys, let's just start working out. Like we have a gym on campus. Like, you yeah. know, we can go for 30 to 45 minutes a day. And, you know, let's just start going to the gym. And that led just to having daily conversations. We would have, you know, we would spend five days a week together for close to an hour. So we, you know, that's how that started. It just, it started as a conversation. And then um, I, I was able to have different one-on-ones with them. And, you know, that's when the, you know, big Jesus question came of like, you know, do you know God? And, you know, it led to, you know, just find, finding faithful, available, teachable people in the marketplace that led to now 20 people. Yeah. So it sounds like you went from that first original group of a few guys to now 20 guys being involved in this small group you have going on. How, how has that grown? What things have led to going from the original three to now 20 being involved? So when I got to the lab, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted my life to count for the workforce. That was the number one priority. Yeah. So I met, you know, Scott and um, Rob right off the bat. So we became great friends and that's where the workout started. And then John, you know, joined this small group. And at the gym, we would definitely meet so many people because, you know, we were the two o'clock crew. So the same people at two o'clock every day would be there. So that's yeah. how um, we um, created this environment. And because I was sociable in that environment, they became sociable. And um, the people I was meeting, they were meeting, and they were even meeting more people. So we just became this big family. But then, you know, I was at that position for two years, and then I decided I needed to move on because the work was um, well developed there. So then I got a new position. And at that position, I met Nathan and Sean there and i invited them to come work out with us and they did and that was another you know set of people that i had from my new team and you know it was this this bigger group of people that would work out together and it was funny because we always thought of who was going to work out with each other because the community was just so great and we couldn't all work out together at that point because it was it went from three of us so we would work out together but then now there was six or seven so we had to break up into groups so just like in that environment you can see like you can't seven people can't work out together because that's just kind of impossible yeah but then again i um, recently got a job four weeks ago and in that job i am looking for the new the new rob the new johns the new scots the new nathans all those people that i can do the same thing with and you know it does it's it hasn't changed from kyle to the workplace it's just 
wherever I'm at, that's where I want to be used. And wherever we are, there's people. So whenever there's people, you know, we just, the fruits there, we just have to be willing to work it. Yeah. I also loved how it grew partly because y'all just went to the same places at the same time and almost you took ownership of the gym, like yeah. two o'clock, whoever was in that gym, those are your people. You know what I mean? Like your guys caught that ownership of the place, just the, the power of consistency almost to where you go onto campus and the lunchroom at this time, when you go there every single day, those people that are in there, those are my people. I'm going to reach them. That's awesome. So what are some convictions you developed in Chi Alpha that have led you to having successful small groups that aren't necessarily centered around the college campus anymore? It, it still sticks with me today. Um, wherever my feet are, that's where my mission field is. So in every part of my life, whether that's work, going to the grocery store, going to Chick-fil-A, to um, church, or you know, even just walking down the road, I make sure that if I see somebody that I can have a conversation with, you know, I try to have that conversation because you never know where that conversation could lead. So in yeah. every, in every part of my, in my life, I try to look for those moments where I can be super intentional because that's where the difference is had to make those new relationships. So what would you say to any small group leaders around the nation who are right now questioning how they're going to meet people and build a small group when they don't even know if there will be events held on campus, let alone a campus to attend. At work, uh, there are uh, 12,000 people on campus. And in Santa Fe, there mm. are 82,000 people. And since COVID, we've been locked up, you know, at home. But that hasn't changed the fact that, you know, I've met new people through meetings, switching a team, you know, trying to meet new customers um, at work. Like my mission field has definitely gotten a lot smaller lately, but that doesn't diminish being intentional with each person because, yeah. you know, when I go to work twice a week, I really try to, you know, meet these people. So whether you're at a college campus or at a local coffee shop, your mission doesn't change, just the environment. And I really learned that um, working in the workforce because, you know, it was a lonely place at first. It was just me. And I had to figure out what I was going to do in all those moments. And, you know, I, I was intentional about trying to find people to hang out with. And that was really helpful with that mentality because it allowed me to see what God wanted us to see. I, I remember finding Andrew, this um, old 70 year old man who me and him were completely different at first, but then we began to talk and I um, began to just learn his wisdom. But then, you know, he didn't know Jesus. So I, I began to lead him to Jesus and eventually baptize him. So that was super cool just to see that. And, you know, if I didn't have um, that intentionality of, oh, this guy looks way older than me, and I didn't go out and find him, and I didn't, you know, pursue, you know, even trying to talk to him, then, you know, then he wouldn't have got baptized. Um, so it's super cool to find those people. And, you know, that's the part about being a discipler um, in any environment is, you know, seeing people through God's eyes and getting the 5,000 to 20,000 people on campus and building a small group of five to 10, or, you know, going into a coffee shop, going into, you know, all these different avenues and building a small group based off of that. And when you're off the college campus, it might be an adjustment, but it's um, possible to do. Um, you just have to look through um, being a small group leader from a different lens with a bigger heart and a bigger perspective. Thank you for listening to the Small Group Leader Podcast. Our goal is to equip and encourage you as you go out and make disciples who make disciples.